back and catching up with old friends. Uh, so we've got a, a great lineup for you today, and without further ado, I'm going to pass you on to uh, Andre Morello, who's going to uh, chair the session this morning. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Andre Morello from UNSW Australia in Sydney. This morning we have a very diverse and very exciting session that's going to be opened by Seth Lloyd from MIT. He will talk about quantum algorithms for topological analysis of data. Welcome, Seth. Thank you very much. Let me see if I can actually get this to work. Oh, it was working before. There, great. So um, uh, uh, this is my... Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what's going, no, this is what happens when you try to, okay. Um. <laughs> this is what happens when you rely on technology. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on here, but. Uh. I don't think this should matter. Um, so, uh, 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 <laughs> what? <laughs> it could be the you think it could be the connector? Yeah. Let's try with this other one. Okay. <laughs> Well, you, you figure it out. So, <laughs> while we're waiting for my PowerPoint slides to come up, <laughs> I'd like to thank the organizers for, for bringing me here. Jeremy gave me a real strong arm to show up. Now I notice that he's not here himself. Uh, <laughs> um, this is a, uh, a uh, uh, I think this conference shows how far quantum computing has come in the last 20 years, um, the, uh, that, you know, b back in uh, 1994, 1993, 1994, when there were only a few people doing it, and people thought, well, maybe we could build a quantum computer, and maybe we couldn't. And then uh, a bunch of people, including me, started using the devices that were at hand, like uh, room temperature NMR systems, um, atoms and cavities. There was some uh, excellent work with ion traps. People were extremely hopeful. Okay, that's fine. This, that one doesn't work, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> People were uh, very hopeful that we could, oh, well, just, you know, this seems to be not that difficult to take existing systems and to perform simple quantum algorithms, you know, on four or five qubits. And then it became clear that it was very difficult and that, that the ch technological challenges of building a, a large-scale quantum computer were actually quite great. And they remain great. But um, we've entered into, uh, uh, really in the last four or five years or so, we've entered into a really interesting era in, in quantum computation and quantum information processing in that it's now, there's now a clear road to building at least a mid-scale quantum computer, say with 50 to 500 quantum bits, with gate fidelities of, you know, 0.9999, and I'm quite confident that within the next five years, we'll have such devices. So I wouldn't be at all surprised, in fact, if in less than five years, for instance, we have a 50 qubit uh, superconducting quantum computer on chip where you could perform hundreds or thousands of operations uh, while still without losing uh, fidelity. And this is a very interesting place to be because it means that for the first time we really will be able to perform quantum computations even on small quantum computers that you can't perform classically. Um, now, uh, uh, of course, there's a lot of work to be done in order to make a quantum computer where you can uh, factor large numbers and do full fault tolerance with you know, hundreds of thousands of logical qubits. Frankly, the technological challenges for doing that are quite daunting. Um, but but uh, right now, I think that we're in really good shape to actually do some pretty serious damage um, in terms of performing quantum computations using small quantum computers. And so what I'm going to talk about today 
are applications for small quantum computers. So I think it's very, in, in some sense, what's happened is the experimentalists have done an amazing job while we poor theorists have failed to construct the theory that we need to give the uses for these amazing devices. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I include, um, there are, you know, if you look at the advances in things like integrated quantum optics, they're really quite remarkable. And I, I feel that, that my fellow theorists and I haven't done our job. So um, I'm going to try to give you an example today of a set of quantum algorithms that could be performed on a small quantum computer, um, say, let's say 100 qubits, 10,000 operations, um, no error correction, uh, and uh, would still do much, much better than any classical algorithm could do. Now, the specific algorithm I'm going to tell you about is this quantum algorithm for topological analysis of data with my colleagues Silvano Garnarone and Paolo Zanardi, um, uh, which is a quantization of a, uh, of a well-known set of classical algorithms for analyzing data. Um, uh, in, in particular, um, the idea here uh, I'll advertise it, then I'll go back, I'll come back in a little bit and tell you more about it. Suppose you have some data. Here's a bunch of data right here, data points. Now this data has a hole in it. I know it's hard to see from there because uh, of, of uh, but, uh, uh, the funny colors on the screen. It was somewhat different on my computer. Uh, but um, it has a hole, but how do we tell that it has a hole? I mean, if you squint up really close, it's all holes. <laughs> Um, uh, and the idea of these algorithms, and I'm talking about the classical algorithm, but it will turn out that this is a perfect application for a quantum computer, is that you start connecting neighboring points, so if they're within epsilon of each other, you connect them together, you end up forming a simplicial complex, and at a certain point in the simplicial complex, the whole emerges. Actually, then if you like start connecting them further and further away points, eventually everything in the whole thing is connected and the whole will eventually fill in again and it will go away. But if it persists over many scales of grouping, then you say, by God, there's a hole there. And this is what's called persistent homology. Um, you're trying to identify topological features of data, holes, voids, connected components, be this persistent homology, and just to tell you how it works, the classical algorithm scales as 2 to the 2n, where n is the number of points here. So in fact, even this number of points that I drew up here would be virtually impossible for a classical computer to figure out the full homology of looking at all holes to all orders. The quantum algorithm goes as n cubed. So it's exponentially faster than the classical algorithm. Uh, it's very suitable for performing on a small quantum computer. Um, <clears throat> so, um, uh, before, however, I tell you how this works, and by the way, this, I should say that the, the, uh, <clears throat> the, I first learned about this, these classical methods for topological analysis of data about six or seven years ago when my friend Mario Rossetti sent me a series of papers on him, and I tried to read them and I couldn't understand them. And then I tried to read them again and I couldn't understand them. Uh, this is very common for me. Actually, I'm the same way with novels. So I try to read a novel and I get a little way in and then I can't, can't get there and then I try reading it again and I can't get there. But eventually, you might get there. Okay. <clears throat> so the math is a little complicated, but in fact, I think that I ought to be able to explain it just by invoking quantum computation because this is such a natural thing to uh, quantize. Um, <clears throat> so, um, but before I tell you about this, let me say that in general, um, ideas for quantum machine learning, so using quantum mechanics for learning patterns in data is a very fruitful application of quantum computation. Um, <clears throat> and let me describe in general how these algorithms work. So it's not a secret, you know, that we're in the middle of a, uh, you know, uh, a, a boom time for machine learning in general. You know, the uh, places like Google and Amazon and, uh, and Microsoft <coughs> are paying six-figure salaries for people with backgrounds in machine learning <coughs> so that they can troll through our data, find out what our patterns, all patterns in our personal life, spy on us and sell us stuff, right? <laughs> this, you know, it's a, 
when these uh, Snowden revelations came out a few years ago, uh, that it turned out that the NSA, the National Security Agency, was spying on everybody. <gasps> Who knew? <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> what a revelation! Um, <laughs> Now, actually, I've, for, for years, I've worked with people from the NSA, not, not on secure kinds of things. I was actually at the very first uh, meeting in Washington, D.C. in 1994, right after Shor's algorithm came out, to um, where the, government, well, the U.S. government was exploring investing large amounts of money in quantum computing. And there was a meeting at DARPA, and uh, there were a bunch of people there. And one of the people there was Keith Miller from the NSA. If you know Keith, he's a delightful and gentle person, uh, quite quiet. And everybody had been chatting away about Shor's algorithm and things like that, and what one could do. And then in the middle of this meeting, Keith Miller got up and spoke for the first time, and he said, I am Keith Miller from the NSA, and I am authorized to tell you the NSA is interested in quantum computing. And then he sat down, and everybody went, oh my god, like somebody from the NSA actually told us what they're actually thinking about. Oh god, this is amazing. It caused such a stir that Keith got up again, and he said, well, I believe I'm also authorized to tell you this. Of course the NSA is interested in quantum computing. <laughs> because the primary mission of the NSA is to keep the secrets of the country secret. You know, 15 years for ordinary secret stuff, 30 years for top secret things. And we have a whole bunch of stuff that's out there that's been encoded using RSA, where if we have a quantum computer in the next 30 years, it will be vulnerable. People can actually read it. And that's bad, and we don't want that to happen. So. <clears throat> our first uh, feeling about quantum computers is that we would prefer that it not be possible to build them. Okay. <laughs> this actually made them great sponsors, right? You know, it's like, you know, they, they call up on the phone, they say, how's it going? Oh, nothing's working, the decoherence times are way too short, we can't put any bits of the Great, great, keep up the good work. <laughs> <laughs> These were the golden years of quantum computing. Uh, only lasted a few years before they got serious. And then he said, however, our secondary mission is to find out the secrets of other people. And for that reason, if it's possible to build a quantum computer, we want to have the first one. Right. <clears throat> Perfectly reasonable. And he sat down again. I don't think he gave away any national secrets by telling us that. <clears throat> May I say, by the way, I kind of, you know, uh, True, the NSA is actually spying on us all the time. But actually, I'm quite convinced that they're spying on us because they wish to protect us from terrorist attacks and things like that. By contrast, we note that you know, places like Google and Amazon and Microsoft and Facebook are spying on us all the time as well. You know, they, Google knows everything about me. Thank goodness its motto is, don't be evil. Oh, whew, dodged a bullet there. Uh, <laughs> and I guarantee you that right out there, right now, there is some terrorist, I'll call him a he, even though there are women terrorists, I don't want to be, uh, don't want to be uh, you know, sexist about this. And a little pop-up window has come up on his computer screen, and the pop-up window says, you just bought two tons of nitrogen-based fertilizer. People who bought two tons of nitrogen-based fertilizer like these detonators. Right. <laughs> so at least the NSA is spying on us to protect us from terrorism than rather simply trying to enable uh, people to do whatever they desire. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, <clears throat> so how does uh, uh, machine learning work? Well, you have a lot of data. And um, uh, let's say it's a big vector in a gigantic vector space, because this is going to be about quantum mechanics of this. We're going to say it's a complex valued vector space, but it works fine if it's real. Um, <clears throat> now, for most of these algorithms, though not for the one I'm going to tell, but tell you about today, you, uh, what you use is you, use the, the, you have your data in a random access memory, a quantum random access memory, and you use this quantum random access memory to map your big, your big vector of data into a quantum state. Um, <clears throat> Now, a quantum random access memory, so uh, uh, is, uh, uh, it's, it's the, the storage medium of the memory could be completely classical. It could, for instance, be a CD. I don't have a CD with me right here. Maybe I have one in my bag. But, but imagine I'm holding a CD. A CD is a little sphere, a disk with billions of little mirrors and pits on it. A mirror is a one, a pit is a zero. And actually, you can encode the information on a CD quantum mechanically in a very simple fashion. In fact, people right here could do it in about 30 seconds in their lab. If I have this CD, 
And I take a single photon, I expand it using a lens so that the spatial wave packet of the photon allows the single photon to bounce off all of the, the entire CD. Then if I look at the state of the photon when it's come off the CD, it is in a quantum superposition of all the places, the modes, where there is a mirror. So the photon actually encodes the entire information on the CD, the classical information on the CD in quantum parallel. A quantum random access memory is a device that does this in a digital kind of fashion. And if you, you, you see this right here, you see that something actually rather remarkable has taken place. I went from, I have an n dimensional space. There are n pieces of data. n could be a huge honking number. But when I map this data, this vector, onto a set of qubits, then I have only log n qubits, because log n qubits inhabit an n-dimensional vector space. So I have an exponential compression of the representation of the data. Um, and this then allows me, if I can now manipulate these quantum states, it turns out that you can, you can actually find out many of the things that people want to find about large data sets. You can find them out in time poly log n. Whereas all the classical algorithms take time polynomial in n. Okay? Um, <clears throat> I should mention that you can do this, this quantum random access memory because it's a very shallow circuit. Uh, it, will, it will tolerate error rates up to 1 over log n, so you don't need error correction for that either. Um, here's an example of things that, that uh, uh, you can do. So one of the first things that was proved by Scott Aronson to be hard on a classical computer is what's called forelation. This always strikes me as vaguely kinky, I'm not sure. <laughs> so <laughs> forelation means you're asking if I have two vectors, x and y, is the Fourier transform of x, does it have a high overlap with y? This is very hard to do classically because if these are large vectors, then you actually have to sample many, 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 many points, actually on the order of the square root of the number of, on the square root of n in order to answer this question. Clearly, quantum mechanically, you can do this right away uh, because you can do a quantum Fourier transform and you can check this out. And then you can check to see if these uh, vectors x and y are correlated or not. And um, <clears throat> uh, so, uh, I, I bring this up first because, first of all, it's proved to be hard classically, and also it shows you what's going on. Once you've actually represented your data as a quantum state, then, uh, uh, then you can actually, there are a lot of things you can do with a quantum computer. You can do quantum Fourier transforms. You can do, uh, find eigenvectors and eigenvalues. You can invert matrices. And all of these things take time poly log n, where they're classical counterpoints parts take time polynomial in n. And so these are all exponentially faster. And if you um, actually take a whole bunch of popular classical machine learning algorithms, you open up the hood, you look what's underneath, and you like r rattle around in the engine, you find that a lot of these things are doing just Fourier transforms, finding eigenvectors and eigenvalues, and, and solving large sets of equations. So if you actually quantize them, if you're careful about how you pack things into this tiny logarithmic sized hood of your quantum car, you can actually make this happen. So here's an example of a, uh, of, uh, of something that you can do. You can do data feed it, fitting. This is an algorithm uh, with uh, Nathan Weber. I'm, uh, I'm a co-author on this algorithm, but Nathan did almost all the work. You have a bunch of points. You wish to construct a polynomial curve that goes through these points while minimizing the error. This you can do exponentially faster on a quantum computer. Um, with my postdoc, Patrick Rebentrost, who is the one who's actually responsible for suggesting that we work on quantum machine learning, uh, we quantized a common kind of algorithm which is called a support vector machine. Here you have two clouds of data and you wish to construct the optimal separating hyperplane or hypersurface, it doesn't have to be a plane, that separates the data. Again, this is something that takes polynomial time in the number of data steps classically and takes time basically log n cubed uh, uh, quantum mechanically. You can then use this to classify points. If I'm given a new point, should it be on this side of the hyperplane or on that side of the hyperplane? You can also answer that question in time poly log n. A very, very common uh, uh, algorithm uh, for data fitting 
and this, this could hardly, I mean, now it goes under the name of machine learning, but people have been doing it forever, is to do principal component analysis. So in principal component analysis, <coughs> you're trying to, you, you look at the covariance matrix of the data. So the covariance matrix of the data, if I, if I have a bunch of these large vectors, is just the sum of the vector times its transpose, which you will actually recognize as the density matrix for the data. The covariance matrix of the data actually will tell you the correlations between the different data. That's why it's called the covariance matrix. And principal co component analysis tries to find the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this, this density matrix. Um, and so, for instance, a, a common question in the stock market is, is all, are all the, the kind of motions of the stocks, are they kind of random? Or are they being driven by some under, un, underlying unknown process, so they're actually highly correlated, but it's hard to pick out the correlations? If they're highly correlated, then there will typically be one large or several large principal components, so several large eigenvalues, and you want to find those eigenvectors because that's tell you what's going to happen. You can see why people are interested in this kind of thing. Um, so this is, a, uh, this is something, again, um, if you're given a density matrix, it, we came up with an algorithm for doing quantum phase algorithm estimation on this density matrix. You can find its eigenvectors and eigenvalues very rapidly. I'm going to tell you today about these topological invariants, but I'll just mention in passing that there's all kinds of fun algorithms you can do for quantum finance, which is, as this principal component analysis of the stock market indicates, is something people do. By the way, there is a company called Quantum Finance. I think it's in Great Britain. It doesn't really have anything to do with quantum mechanics. So we want to do real quantum finance. Actually, we have some quite fun algorithms here. One is for uh, portfolio management. So um, given, if you're given vectors that tell you the prices, historical records of prices in the stock exchange, and you'd like to construct um, a, uh, an investment basket, a basket of investments, you'd like to do it so that it maximizes the return subject to a constraint on the variance. So you want to have the, the uh, if you give, pick a particular return, you'd like to have the basket that minimizes the variance because this will give you your largest profit. And we can actually, you can find this again exponentially faster on a quantum computer. I should mention that the reason, our reason for looking at these uh, 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 quantum finance things are not merely to, you know, so we can come up with a trillion dollar quantum algorithm. I felt that, you know, in 2007, 2008, when the uh, global markets were all tanking and my life savings were going down the tube, um, I looked and see what was happen and happening and, uh, you know, actually, frankly, though I should, probably shouldn't say this because this talk is being recorded, we physicists are to blame, right? I mean, you know, there are more PhD theoretical physicists on Wall Street than there are in all the, uh, all the faculties of all the physics departments in the United States. Um, and indeed, if you're a big Wall Street firm and you wish to actually construct complicated options that are gonna make you money, you want to hire people who are mathematically adept who know how to relate their complicated mathematical models to, you know, real physical facts on the ground. And so you should definitely hire a bunch of string theorists. Um, so, <laughs> so <laughs> sorry, excuse me. I apologize to any string theorists who are here. Uh, <laughs> okay, <clears throat> enough of that. Let me tell you how this algorithm works. <laughs> okay, so I'll just go over what I was saying before. The way that, let's look at these topological uh, uh, methods for, uh, for analyzing data. Um, why should you analyze the topology of data in the first place? Um, actually, the best, uh, most compelling reason for this came to me when Michael Friedman, um, who, as we, people here know him well, you know, he's a fields medalist in topology, and he also does a lot of stuff on quantum computing. So he, and he was one of the people responsible for these methods starting back in the 1970s um, and 80s. Uh, he said, look, data is information we collect about features that are there in the real world. By the mere act of collecting data, we are distorting the relationships between those features. The data presents a distorted picture of what's out there because it can't be exact, it's data. Now, topological features of something that's out there in the real world are exactly the features that are invariant under continuous distortions. So, if you wish to actually extract features that are out there in the real world from data, then topological features are the way to go. Um, and so here's how the method works. 
I described it before, I'll describe it again. Here is this piece of data, it's got a hole in it. You start grouping the data together as in little epsilon balls. Here, nothing is connected to anything else, so the data is all holes. You don't see that hole there, it doesn't show up. However, once you start grouping things together at a larger scale, then the things that are close to each other get grouped together, and you see that if I group together things at this scale, you'll find, oh, there's a hole there. Now, as I increase this scale of grouping, the hole will persist and persist and persist. Eventually, it will go away. So now there are no holes, and so we say topological features that persist over a wide range of grouping scales are considered to be actual features of the data. This is how these classical algorithms work. It's also how the quantum algorithm works. Okay, so let me actually uh, <coughs> tell you how you actually do this quantum mechanically. And this is how you do it classically, but I'm explaining it quantum mechanically because it's easier quantum mechanically. Also, I myself, you know, even though I'm a professor of mechanical engineering, I've forgotten how to do classical mechanics, so when I teach the harmonic oscillator, I have to unquantize the harmonic oscillator for my, for my students. <laughs> so the method is based on algebraic topology. Um, who, who here has ever studied algebraic topology? All right, excellent, good. All right, but not most people. Okay, let me tell you how it works. I never, I never formally studied it, but now I've studied it a fair amount. So the idea in algebraic topology is that you're going to construct a representation of one of these point complices by simplices. So the idea is that when these three points are grouped together, so they're connected by lines, they form a simplex. In this case, it's a triangle or a two simplex. Um, <clears throat> And the way that algebraic topology works is you map k simplices to vectors in a very high dimensional space. So for instance, this two simplex, this triangle, gets mapped to this vector, and you see uh, if we have n points, the space is two to the n dimensional. So it works beautifully for qubits, and indeed here I just represent this simplex by putting a one where the vertices are, and zeros everywhere else. So this state of qubits, 110001, is the quantum state that corresponds to this triangle. Okay? Um, now, um, algebraic topology, as its name suggests, uh, allows us to perform topological analysis of these simplicial complexes by uh, performing algebra on this high dimensional vector space. Now, this is why the classical algorithms are hard, because two to the n dimensional vector space is pretty high dimensional. But quantum mechanically, everything is hunky-dory, as we'll see. So the, the central object in algebraic topology for this topological analysis is called the boundary map. And what the boundary map does is it maps a simplex, each simplex gets mapped to the boundary of the simplex, which is the oriented sum of the simplices on its boundary. So you see the boundary of this is th are these three lines, one, six, six, two, and one, two. Here's one of them, here's one, six, here's one, two, here's six, three. And you map that, you pick an orientation, you give a minus sign that gives you the correct orientation, and it maps a simplex, a vector, into a sum of vectors corresponding to simplices of one degree less. So in this case, it's mapping a three simplex to an oriented sum, Oriented just means we keep track of the minus signs of the simplices on the boundary. Um, and this says just what I just said right there. This has this very cool feature that because you're keeping track of these orientations, if I take the sum of two simplices, so these two simplices right here, which share an edge, these are actually in the algebraic topological picture. This is just the sum of these two vectors. And I apply the boundary map and I get the sum of these two things, but this 2, 4 edge appears twice with opposite orientations, and because of that, the minus signs cancel out, and so it will map this sum into just the 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, and 1, 4, and the parts in the middle will cancel out. And so the boundary map maps a chain of simplices, which in our case is just a quantum superposition of simplices, to the boundary of the simplices. And this is actually a super great trick, and it's what makes algebraic topology tick. Um, 
So, oh, I'll just mention right here that this boundary map, just to, just to, to show you why we can do this quantum mechanically, the boundary map is sparse. It's a two to the n by two to the n dimensional um, uh, matrix. But if each entry, if these are the basis vectors, then uh, for a k simplex, there are only um, k terms that show up. So it's k uh, column sparse. It actually turns out to be n minus k row sparse. It is a sparse matrix. And quantum computers are awesome at dealing with sparse matrices. In particular, we can diagonalize this boundary map. Okay, so what are we looking for here? <clears throat> now, um, th this, uh, this is kind of a slogan, um, but if you think of it for the moment, the things that we're looking for, we're looking for connected components, we're looking for holes, we're looking for voids, two or three dimensional voids, we're looking for k-dimensional holes and voids and gaps. If you think about it for a moment, these correspond to sets of simplices that have no boundary. So if I have a, a circle, for instance, if I just uh, have a, a set that, that's closed, it doesn't have a boundary. But there are plenty of things that don't have boundaries, and we're looking for the things that don't have boundaries, they're boundaryless, but that are not themselves boundaries of something else. So for instance, in this picture right here, here is this little uh, pentagon right here. Uh, it's boundaryless, because it's a cycle, it doesn't have a boundary, but it's the boundary of these five things in the middle. That is not a topological feature. However, if I look at this torus right here, and I look at this particular loop that goes around it, this is boundaryless, but it's not the boundary of something in the set. And the, the fancy pants mathematical ways of, of looking at this is saying we're looking for superpositions, chains of simplices that lie in the kernel of the boundary map as applied to k simplices, which means they don't have a boundary. They're, they're annihilated by the boundary map. But they're not in the image of the boundary map applied at one level above. That is to say they're not boundaries of stuff that's at one level up. So that's our goal, and this is how these topological algorithms work. Doing good. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, so, uh, uh, oh, and by the way, the classical, this is why the classical algorithms are hard, because we're actually trying to uh, find um, kernels of very high dimensional vector, of uh, high dimensional matrices, and that's hard. You basically do it by Gaussian elimination. It takes time, order the dimension cubed, or because these are sparse, the dimension squared. The dimension is two to the n, so the classical algorithms take time two to the two n. And there's really no way of getting around that. The classical algorithms, they're, they're, they're used all over the place. It's a whole subfield of machine learning, um, but they're typically used only for very small dimensional simplices. If you look at pictures, they only show up uh, or for things that are ba basically um, two to two and two dimensional. That's about as high, high as you get. Here's how our algorithm works. Okay, so for each, I'll just describe the steps. For each grouping scale epsilon, we construct a quantum superposition of all the simplices in the complex. So this, for this, we use essentially Grover search. Um, uh, uh, and the algorithm will kick in Basically, when there's a large fraction, or a, a non-negligible fraction, I should say, of k simplices in the complex are being grouped together. Now, as we're changing this grouping scale, eventually every simplex will be in the complex. Every simplex will be in the complex. This is what the kind of thing you find yourself saying after years of working on this field. Uh, <laughs> every simplex will be in the complex, so you know that at a certain scale, epsilon, you, it's, you're, this is gonna kick in, and you'll be able to find this set of simplices. Now, <clears throat> we use the quantum phase algorithm to decompose this superposition of all simplices in terms of eigenvectors of what's called the combinatorial Laplacian, which is constructed from this boundary map. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, if you look at this, it's got two terms. So the combinatorial Laplacian is del k dagger del k, and then it's also del k plus one, del k plus one dagger. If you look at this term right here, these both are positive maps. Um, and 
the only way that you can have a zero eigenvalue is if you're a zero eigenvalue of this part, which means that you don't have a boundary, because if you squint at this, you'll see, ah, the del k has to annihilate this, so there's no boundary. And the only way you can be a zero eigenvalue of this part is if you are not the image of something at the higher level. So the kernel of this map is exactly this set of vectors, a subspace of vectors, actually, that are boundaryless but don't have a boundary. And these are the representatives of the homology. Actually, I should say, these are actually what are called harmonic forms. And they, each harmonic form, these, these that is the, the basis vectors that span the kernel of this combinatorial Laplacian are harmonic forms. And each one of them corresponds to um, one of these things I described before things that are boundaryless but don't have boundaries. So this allows us to actually find this persistent homology. And uh, the dimension of this kernel is what's called the kth Betty number. Um, this is just the number of holes, voids, or connected components in k dimensions. So the, the, the zeroth Betty number is just the number of connected components. The first Betty number is the number of, of holes, one dimension, holes bounded by one-dimensional surfaces. The second Betty number is the number of voids bounded by two-dimensional surfaces. The third is the number I can't, now I would have to have some very complicated thing actually to make the third dimensional one, but it, it's the number of three-dimensional, sorry, four-dimensional voids bounded by three-dimensional surfaces, etc. And as I mentioned before, because the boundary map is n sparse, this quantum algorithm takes time order n cubed, uh, whereas the classical algorithm, which involves applying Gaussian elimination to the diagonalization of sparse matrices, takes time order 2 to the 2n. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. So, it's, uh, uh, <coughs> yeah, I'm, I'm almost done here. I think I'll have time to show a funky picture that I want to show, show you, just to show you what these kinds of things are used for. Um, <coughs> so, uh, 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 so, Order n cubed, okay? So um, if you have, this is the kind of thing, if you have, um, you know, 50 qubits, so order n cubed versus order 2 to the 2n. 50 qubits, classical computer takes time 2 to the 200. <coughs> Quantum computer takes time 50 cubed. <sighs> um, uh, you know, you can do this on a small quantum computer. And you definitely cannot do it on even the world's largest classical computer. Um, <clears throat> by the way, this is also true for these other quantum machine learning algorithms as well. This one has the feature that you don't need a quantum random access memory for this because uh, the, the exponential speed up for the quantum algorithm over the classical one comes because these topological problems have a combinatorial explosion in them. There's, you know, two to the two n, two to the two n possible simplices in the complex. It's a lot of simplices. The quantum algorithm works simply by mapping them onto n qubits, and so it tames this combinatorial explosion, which is untamed classically. So, how did the algorithm work? It's a quantum algorithm for algebraic topology. I hope that for the people who know algebraic topology, that I didn't mutilate it too much. Uh, for the people who didn't know it, I hope that actually explained what's going on. I have to tell you, it took me months to figure out that this was what was going on in algebraic topology. And the only way I was able to do it was actually by quantizing it. It's like, oh, if you quantize it, it makes sense. It's like easy, right? <laughs> uh, uh, so and that's still the way I understand it. Um, you end up finding eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this combinatorial Laplacian, which is a huge honking Hermitian sparse matrix. The zero eigenvalues, which will give you the dimension of the kernel, uh, gives the Betty number, sorry, the number of zero eigenvalues, the dimension of the kernel of this combinatorial Laplacian, give you these Betty numbers, which count the number of topological features at dimension k. The eigenstates, which are these harmonic forms, are these things that are boundaryless, but not themselves boundaries, and these are what are called the representatives of the homology. So you can actually find the Betty numbers, you can track the rep generators of homology, you can do the whole persistent homology of this complex and you can do it a lot faster. Actually, you get a bunch of stuff for free because in the process you also find all the other eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the Laplacian. 
Um, <clears throat> uh, this is actually a famous problem. Mark Koch, uh, in, in 1960, wrote this famous paper, Can You Hear the Shape of a Drum? Right? This is a famous paper. And the, the, the Laplacian, if you actually look at this, Laplacian is actually, it's quite a simple, if I think of it as a Hamiltonian for some process, it's a Hamiltonian that induces diffusion of the simplices through the complex. So basically it says, I can move, uh, I, I can move from one place to another, I can move to any simplex with which I share a boundary. Okay, that's what this, this, part, this part tells me. And then it says, I can also move to any simplex of which I am, a, I can move to another simplex if I have the boundary, if we're parts of the boundary of the same larger dimensional simplex. Okay, running out of time here. So, <clears throat> and in fact, so these eigenvectors and eigenvalues are quite a sweet thing, and they tell you, for instance, the rate of the energy gap between the zero eigenspace and the next eigenvalue tells you about the uh, convergence of this diffusion process. So this is the, yes, so this is actually, I want to show, end by showing, I think I have time to show this last little picture. So anyway, the quantum algorithm is, uh, does extremely well. Um, let me see if I can't actually uh, find a nice picture for you to show in the last uh, minute right here. It should be in this brain. Oh, no, 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 that's, uh, sorry about that. Maybe I won't be able to find it. Okay, I'll just describe it to you. Uh, uh, I should have found this before. <clears throat> so our collaborators on this um, are, uh, uh, <coughs> um, they, they are, uh, uh, of course I had to enlist a bunch of actual mathematicians to do this because the math was too complicated for me and I've learned, you know, I, that, this, people often say to me, these are just ordinary people who talk to me, they say, oh, I'm really bad at math. And I say to them, that's funny, I'm really bad at math too. And they say, oh no, you must be really good at math. I say, no, it's not like that. So, so, so um, you know, when I was in high school, I was really good at math. And when I was in college, I was good at math. And when I was in graduate school, I was pretty good at math. And now I'm just bad at math. It's an example of this thing called the Peter Prince, Peter's Principle, right? You, you're in a job, and you do well, so you get promoted. And then you do well, so you get promoted again. And you do well, so you get promoted again. And finally, you're bad and then you don't get promoted anymore. So everybody gets promoted to the level of their incompetence. And I've definitely been promoted to the, my level of incompetence in math. Um, <clears throat> let me just close by, by saying, okay, uh, descri I'll describe this picture and I urge you to look at it. You can find it easily on the web. It was Wired Magazine's best scientific graphic of 2015. It's on a paper on algebraic topology the paper is in incomprehensible to any mortal person, or maybe comprehensible to maybe 100 people. But the paper shows two things. Basically, they do a topological analysis of brain scans, a functional MRI on the brain, 256 different sectors of the brain, figuring out which parts of the brain are talking to which other parts. And you want to find the topology of the thought process. So there are two parts to this diagram. One is a picture of the thought process when you're on an ordinary resting state. Turns out you're thinking about like 15 or 20 different things simultaneously. And there are little connections between them, so they're connecting up with each other. So the different 15 or 20 things that you're thinking about are all talking with each other, but not very closely. <clears throat> Um, it's a very nice picture, the topology of the thought process. The second picture is this picture also of the topology of the thought process, but for subjects who'd been given psilocybin, magic mushrooms. <laughs> so this is the topology of your brain. This is the topology of your brain on drugs. Uh, and and I, 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 I'm afraid I didn't have the picture, but I, you can find it. I'll give you a hint. Everything is connected. <laughs> You're thinking about many, many more things than everything's connected with everything else, and it's not surprising that you see like weird shapes and stuff like that. <laughs> anyway, um, so I think that there are many algorithms that could be useful about for small quantum computers. It's us to us up to us theorists to step up to the plate or, or to the wicket, I guess I should say, and uh, and to uh, come up with these algorithms. Um, uh, I think that these quantum machine learning algorithms are a particularly nice one because they could do something on a small quantum computer without error correction that a classical computer couldn't. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, we have time for maybe one or two quick questions. One there.
Yeah. What determines which one gets uh, a minus sign? Ah, uh, let's see. Uh, there's, hey, there's no blackboard here. We're gonna <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, once you've picked an ordering for your points, this gives an ordering for the simplices. And basically, when you take a simplex, the first, you, you construct the simplices on the boundaries, you knock out vertices one by one. Um, in the, the ordering that you've been given of these. So, so the first one that you knock out doesn't get a minus sign. The second that we knock out does get a minus sign. The third one you knock out doesn't get a minus sign. The fourth one does get a minus sign. So the mi minus signs alter, alternate as you go around the simplex. And, and this has the feature that because of the orientation, as I mentioned before, if I have, you know, if, I, if a simplex is shared by, an edge is shared by two simplices, it will get knocked out by the boundary map. Probably not. Right? <laughs> um, yeah. At the beginning, you talked about the fact that the QRAM is a is sort of a data compression, right? Yeah. You, you take these That's big the vectors and you turn them into into cats. But the answer of your algorithm is this eigenvector that tells you where this persistent homology is, and that's yes. compressed, right? You need to right. decompress it in order to make it useful. And I didn't catch how that happens. Right. So the first thing, the first part of the algorithm, just calculates, estimates these Betty numbers. That just gives you a number. Right. So the second part of the algorithm, what you're actually interested in is to, to find um, these holes and to track them. And you can track them without ever finding out what they are. But of course, if you actually, what you're really interested in is what, in fact, these harmonic forms are, then if you actually wanted to find out what each simplex is in it, that would take you a large time to find out. But that's actually not what you're interested in in, in these algorithms. So the classical algorithms do what are called a barcode. You want to find, the barcode says, this hole came into existence. Here, sorry, here's this, this axis is the scale of grouping, this epsilon. It's called a filtration. And so when a topological feature comes into existence, you say, aha, this void or hole came into existence. I increase epsilon, it still exists, it still exists, it still exists, it still exists, and then it went away again at a certain point. So the barcode just tracks when these features come into existence, how long they persist, and then when they go away again. For that, you don't have to know what they actually are. You just have to know when they came into existence. So the, the quantum algorithm reproduces what the classical people want without ever having to figure out what these harmonic forms actually are. Thanks. Meanwhile, John Morton has done some great community uh, service there we and go. found the picture. <laughs> Right, there you go, thank you. Yes, yeah. the, 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 so this is a miracle, the miracle of science. No, the miracle of the internet, yes. Left, the, the, that side, this side right here, the right-hand side, this is your topology of your brain. Each of these dots okay. represents some kind of connected group of, of neurons that are firing uh, in coordination with each other. The lines going across represent the connections between different tightly clustered set of firing neurons. So the idea, tightly set of clustered set of firing neurons is the thought process. They're connected with each other. That's the topology of your brain on magic mushrooms. Okay. And on this <laughs> note, let's thank Seth again. <laughs>